Hey, welcome to the channel. My name is Tyler. Your name is uh, Alexis. I'm a little bit of la 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 la. A little bit of Alexis. Today I want to do something different and try out a little bit more of a long form video. So we're going to go through the whole process of one of the robot designs I did for March of Robots. Okay, so we start off with doing some sketches. You can see that I did a bundle of these. Uh, so this is one of the last ones that I did. And um, just sketching, uh, you can see that I don't really know what I'm doing. In fact, I'm just basically scribbling to try and find some sort of form. I didn't really have a plan going into this. So it's basically just organically moving the pen around, seeing what I come up with until hopefully something starts to stick and I see something that I find interesting and then sort of build on that. So here I'm starting to see some sort of idea of a pose. And uh, these started off as rough silhouette sketches. You can see some of them are more full silhouettes, but I tend to quickly fall back to this line drawing type sketching just because that's what uh, I do more naturally. But the nice thing about this is because I'm using a larger nibbed pen, uh, because I was going to do silhouettes, with the larger nib, you can't get too fussy about details or anything. It's still large forms. And to me, it reminds me of Copic markers. Um, when sketching in a sketchbook, you're essentially using like a light gray marker to lay in a general rough idea, uh, figure out proportions, that kind of stuff. Um, but the nib is sort of too large to get into unnecessary details at this stage, which is a good thing. You don't want to get into that stuff too early. So um, that's one of the reasons I also like doing this digitally is it just reminds me of uh, sketchbook sketching with a Copic marker. Like I said, um, it's a larger nib, so you can't get too fussy with details. It's more about proportion, stance, that kind of stuff, getting the general idea down, but without getting too into the weeds with details. You can see here, I'm, I struggle with this, you know, I, I, once I had the pose figured out, I wanted him leaning on some sort of stick, but I wasn't sure what the stick was going to be experimented with some sort of like skull or maybe it's another robot head or something. Um, I struggle with that all the way through. Um, I think I ended up changing it like right at the end. So that's basically the idea for the pose there. And this was a month long challenge, so I was feeling kind of tired by this point. So that was the inspiration for this pose, just, you know, pure exhaustion. So now we're into it and we're just going to fill out the silhouette and also clean up the, the edges of the silhouette. And uh, you'll notice that where I've got the head, uh, I don't want to lose that. Uh, I want to remind myself of where that is. I could always you know, put it in later, but I wanted to give myself a reminder of where it is, what the general proportion was. So I sort of do a rough outline of that just to remind myself later where that is. And, uh, but other than that, it's just filling out the silhouette and cleaning up the edges. So as I said, uh, this was a series, it was for March of Robots, which is an entire month of doing robot sketches. The manner in which you do them doesn't matter. It can be uh, sketches in a sketchbook, they can be unrefined, they can be painted, it can be entire illustrations if you want. Uh, there's no real rules to it and I did them in batches so I did so I did loose sketches like this for the first half and then the second half so this is on to the second half this is at least day 15 if not 16 or something and I was already feeling pretty tired and I knew that I was halfway there uh, which is both a good thing but also it was kind of daunting to think oh man I have to do all of that again so I was feeling kind of tired and uh, this sketch came out and I knew that I would be feeling like this on day 31 as well. Uh, so as soon as I started figuring this one out, I knew that this was going to be robot 31. And uh, it definitely represents the way I was feeling at the time.
So you see now that the general idea is down, I'm really just cleaning it up and um, figuring out you know, what the silhouette actually looks like because right now it's just a general idea. So just trying to figure out where the forms go in and out, proportions. I don't want to lose the energy that I have in the initial sketch. That does sort of happen automatically. The more you refine something, the more you lose the energy and it is quite difficult to keep that throughout the whole process. For this one, I kept it simple too. I didn't want to sort of over engineer the design. So you can see things like the knees and ankles. They're really just big cylinders uh, on the edges of the joints, like the knees and ankles. Um, and that's maybe a little bit pedestrian. It's less design than it could be, but I think that's okay. It keeps things simple. It's easy to read. So you get the general idea without me having to fuss over it. With this month of designs, I basically just wanted to make it somewhat easy on myself and not take it too seriously, not worry about doing you know an amazing job with it or anything, just sort of have fun and see what I can come up with. So in that vein, I didn't fuss the details too much. And here what I'm doing is, I know I'm going to have to render the pole that he's holding, and but I know there's going to be a hand there, and obviously his forearm is behind the pole. And so I'm going to run into issues with overlaps and having to render different things. And be, especially because I didn't know what I want to do with, with the pole or stick or whatever it is that he's holding, I wanted that on a separate layer. So I just selected that, put it onto a new layer, and now I'm just trying to refine that design a little bit. Um, I don't know what the heck I'm doing here. It's, you know, some sort of lantern or something maybe. Uh, this ends up changing in the final design. But by having it on a separate layer, it gives me the availability to do whatever I want with both the pole or the stick and the character itself. So once I've got that, I duplicate the layer with the robot on it and make the new layer a medium gray. And that's essentially going to be my light. So I'm doing light versus dark. And my darks will be the black layer that is still there underneath it. And I've got a second layer that is now gray. But because I have some gaps like around the head and that kind of thing, I need to go back to the black layer momentarily and fill those in. And now, now that I've got the gray layer, what I do is I mask it and I'm actually painting into the mask. So as I'm painting in light and shadow, I'm actually doing that on the mask of the layer. It's not actual paint, it is the mask. So the darks that I'm getting is actually, it's the gray layer, but I'm painting black into the mask, which hides that layer. And we're seeing the black layer underneath. And that's what's giving me the different values. And then from there, I can still color pick because the mask is black and white. I'm color picking shades of gray. So I'm painting in all the different shades of gray in the mask itself. There's not necessarily a benefit to doing this way. I was just sort of messing around with a new technique. I definitely did some of these robots painting in actual, you know, paint black and black and white and gray. But I was also experimenting with painting in the actual mask, which is what I'm doing here. And one of the reasons for that is because as I apply things like color and that kind of thing, I wanted it to only apply to that gray layer and not necessarily all the shadow parts. And this way I could sneak in other layers sort of on top of the black layer if I wanted to. Uh, it just gives me a, a little bit more leniency, but I wouldn't say this is a better approach than just painting in black and white. 
it all amounts to the same thing and this is me just you know experimenting and playing one of the reasons i was doing it this way is because i wanted to give a little bit more attention to the shadows or at least let the shadows do a lot of work so especially with this hunched over posture i can have you know a lot of that body is actually in shadows and i don't have to worry too much about what's happening there here i'm trying to refine the head and this does uh, cause me a little bit of trouble i'm trying to find a balance between um, the more hunched over he is and the more downward that the face is facing um, that better sells the posture overall and the pose um, but it also I didn't want to completely hide the face so uh, trying to find that sort of downward three-quarter angle at, at an angle that both sells the pose but shows enough of his face uh, took a little bit of doing to try and um, find something that like a happy medium that I was happy with so I think I go back to that a couple of times as you'll see but what really sells the downward face actually is the bounce light. So you can see that it's sort of the forehead gets a bit of shadow there, but then a lot of the face is actually pretty light and that would be coming from bounce light from the ground. And then things like joints, like elbows and that kind of thing. Um, again, working with the shadow and sort of letting the shadows do a lot of the work. I figure any kind of greebly bits, anything that's highly detailed, uh, mechanical parts. I sort of leave in shadow. Um, I paint in mostly black and then I can start painting back in in the mask, you know, bring back some of those grays and stuff like that just to indicate some mechanisms. But I'm not really doing a whole lot of, you know, figuring out what the mechanisms do or anything. It's all sort of cheats. And so I'm leaving the mechanical joints and that kind of stuff dark. And then anything that is like a big panel uh, or some sort of uh, smooth surface that does catch more light. So things like the body, the head and the forearms are like these large panel pieces and everything else just stays in shadow. For the torso here, I'm adding a little bit of details, but I'm keeping it mostly black and I'm hinting at some bounce light catching some surfaces like hydraulics and things like that uh, but by keeping it a very dark gray i'm not drawing attention to it because i don't want that to be an area of focus so it's just staying dark and that also helps me not have to figure out the mechanisms too much i can just kind of hint at like i could just draw a dark gray line and especially because it's low contrast first of all you might not notice it and second of all, if you do, you know, you might just interpret it as a hydraulic or something like that. Uh, so it's, it's a way of hinting at what's there without having to actually figure it out super well. And those kind of decisions are for a multitude of purposes. You know, one is just to make my life easier, but it also, I think, makes the viewer an active participant with the artwork because they're sort of making those decisions and they're filling in uh, that kind of information. You don't have to spell everything out. In fact, I think it's better if you don't spell everything out for the viewer. I think that makes for a more interesting um, experience. You'll see every once in a while, you'll see flash up a um, the original sketch. So I did keep the original sketch on another layer as well, just to, uh, you know, as I start painting it, I'm going to lose the reference of where I had hands and different elements like that. So it just serves as a reminder for myself of where these things are. Of course, those can change. You know, I don't have to stick to the sketch verbatim, but there was a looseness and an energy that I did like in the sketch, and that's why I do refer back to it several times. Here's starting to get into details a little bit, some smaller like little sections, cut lines, that kind of stuff.
And of course that gap around the head um, shouldn't actually be there. I mean, he could have a hole in the body where the head and neck emerge, but um, it's certainly the top side there that would disappear. So I'm just trying to refine the head and keep some separation between the head and the torso so that they don't get lost. Uh, you know, I don't want his, I want his head to be obviously, you know, sort of coming off of the shoulder so that it doesn't get interpreted as all one piece. So I do the same thing for the lantern. It's the exact same step. So I've got a black layer and then I duplicate it, make it gray. And then I'm painting in and out of the mask. This part here essentially becomes a waste of time because I end up scrapping all of this later, but um, that's okay. It's part of the process of just, you know, figuring it, it out. I should say this video is sped up three times, so it's, uh, or two, two and a half maybe. It's somewhere between 250 and 300% speed. So I don't, I don't paint this fast. Um, but I think this is slow enough that you can see what I'm doing. Uh, I'm not hiding any steps or anything, but it does get fairly long if it's fully real time. In total, this took two hours for the silhouette refinement and the painting. So two hours, not including the initial sketch, which probably took about you know five minutes or something to do. So just over two hours, probably. And now I'm going into the head and just figuring out, you know, what is the design for the face? Where are the eyes? What are the cut lines? That kind of stuff. The cut lines, I essentially go back to line, but I do find that cut lines, especially on mechanical objects, are very important because if you're too heavy handed with them, you can actually change the size and proportions of things. And you can see I start to do the same thing on the body. And again, this becomes really important because if you have a big form, if you subdivide it too much, then your big shape can accidentally start becoming a bunch of medium shapes or even small shapes. And it can throw off the proportions that you are working with and it can throw off the flow of the design. So it becomes rather important to add these cut lines in hopefully a meaningful way and a way that continues to provide balance. So you can see I try out a lot of different things. I don't like a lot of stuff. Um, I'm playing around with, you know, what if all of that is open and it's, you know, we, we see into the cavity of the body there. Didn't like it, so I erased that. So it's a lot of trial and error. Again, because at this point, like I said, the cut lines become quite important because you can kind of ruin a design at this stage. So, and it's one of those things that I don't know if I'm ever fully happy with. It's just one of those options, but in the same way that you can have a page full of designs in terms of silhouettes and stuff like that, that I could do pages of just figuring out what the cut lines are. And especially when we get into color and value and, and have breakup of these kinds of things, because it can change your design quite a lot, I could do pages and pages of just, you know, different color combinations and uh, different value combinations. It will change the read of your design. So 
So you can see from this one here, uh, now this isn't uh, perfect. I don't have a great way to A, B this right now, but um, you can see that I did experiment with making the forearms, uh, the panels on the forearms white as well as the head. And um, it changes the balance of it overall. Like, so again, the face isn't perfect. You can see the values change a little bit there, but just to give you the general idea that um, it takes attention away from the face certainly. And it also kind of creates too much of a separation between the top and the bottom as like a 50-50 split. You basically have like white panels on the bottom half and blue on the top. And it creates um, sort of too perfect of a division. And especially with the head being so small and within the silhouette, it doesn't draw much attention to the face. So by having the white more dominant on just the face, there are some sections where there's a little bit of white there, but they're a lot less dominant. So by doing that, I'm drawing a lot more attention to the face, which is where I want my focal point. So that's just an example to show you, you know, the way you split up your values and your color patterns really does affect how something can be read. So it becomes this push and pull of where are you leading the eye and what are these shapes and colors doing? You can isolate things, draw attention to focal points, and you can completely change the balance and shape language of an object purely by your division of shapes and colors and values. And so with all of that said, this stage of figuring out cut lines and stuff, it's sort of back to the beginning. It's, it's going back to what is the main design that I'm doing? How are these shapes broken up? So now you can see I'm trying to extend the head a little bit, extend the top of the head and sort of, I think the face part would be more foreshortened. So playing around with that, Still not super happy with it. It's looking a little bit too uh, square at the moment. So seeing if I can sort of round off that shape overall a little bit more. And of course, all the line work I did sort of gets screwed up, but that's fine. I think the form is more important. Things like cut lines are still secondary, you know, as much as I just went over how important they can be in terms of subdividing your forms. Ultimately, the big forms are your main read. Uh, they become definitely more important. So it's more important to figure those out. And that's really why I'm revisiting this. You know, I saw that that wasn't working the way I wanted it to. So going back and then once I've got that figured out, it's just applying the cut lines that now fit this form. Okay, so now that we start getting into color here, first thing I want to do is create a little bit more contrast between my darks and shadows. So I just do a level adjustment layer. And now what I'm doing is, uh, you can't see it uh, on screen, unfortunately, it was on the other monitor, uh, the pop-up window, but I'm doing a gradient layer mask. So I'm just creating different colors. Um, if you don't know what gradient masks are, they basically allow you to color grade an object um, from shadows to light, and you can have a whole spectrum of color that uh, gets applied to different values within your image. So I'm doing that, just doing subtle tweaks as to you know what are my mids, that kind of thing. But that is only really being applied to the gray layer. Because I've got it as a clipping path, it is only being applied to the gray layer. The downside to that is, of course, the contrast between your color and your black can be a little bit too extreme. Uh, so what I do is I go back to grayscale so I can see that, and then I go and create a new layer between my black layer and the gray layer, and I can just sneak in a little bit more value to kind of brighten up the darks a little bit, essentially light the shadows just a little bit more so that the contrast isn't quite so strong. 
There I just did a hue saturation layer and that just allows me to shift the hue very easily with one slider just to see if I can change the color and, and get something slightly more interesting. Then I add a new layer and set it to color so that it won't affect my values. And what I'm doing there is just adding some very subtle color shifts from one side to the other and that just adds a little bit more visual interest. Makes the design slightly less boring by uh, feeling less flat and just adding a little bit more variation in there. Now I want my secondary color, which is going to be a dark material. So I do a hue saturation layer and you can see that I figure out sort of the base color, but then bring the value way down so that it basically becomes uh, a very dark metal. And then again, I'm just painting into the mask to decide, you know, where is that dark material? had some trouble there with figuring out what was going on, but I think the reason was I was painting not with a white brush, but a um, the the color on my my brush was gray, so the <laughs> the effect wasn't kicking in fully. And of course, that's one of the problems with painting in with masks. Um, a lot of times, you do want it just white and black, because right now I'm just determining you know what is the secondary color and what is not. So it's, you know, full opacity, white and black. And so again, this is where those cut lines become important. And more important than that is because I've created these panels now, it's really a, a push and pull of, you know, which sections get what value and what color. And as I said, that can completely change your design. So this stage actually becomes very important to me trying to figure out what is best. And again, I don't ever know if I really make the right decision. I just hopefully do a good enough job that I'm happy with it. But uh, I could spend all day messing with, you know, the breakups of, of shapes and colors and uh, what goes where. That's sort of a never ending battle for me. But it's also one of the more fun parts. You see this a lot with character design, um, the breakups of, you know, you see like the color sheets where they'll have one outfit, but they color it completely differently. And that stage is not to be taken lightly because those values and colors and like the combinations they make can be very, very important with how we read the character. So now I'm doing the same thing with another hue saturation layer and I want to uh, do a lighter materials, something like a, like a white plastic or something like that. Or maybe like a light gray. So again, this becomes part of the same exercise. You know, where, where does this white material start and end? You know, is that too much by having that whole panel do, does the white go onto the shoulders or not? What about the face? You can see I go back and forth a few times here. You know, what if the sides of the face are white? What about this collar piece here? That could be the dark metal. It could stay red. It could be white. Um, just trying to find, you know, what works best with this particular design. Now I'm killing this part. It's just push and pull. You can see I'm undoing some of my decisions here, going back and forth. Now I'm thinking, what if all that collar section is the darker material? And that's one benefit to having all these things on different hue saturation layers is it just becomes a matter of, you know, what goes where and you don't have to repaint any of that. It's just, you know, adding it or subtracting it from the mask of that particular layer. Thank you. 
trying to include some of that lighter material in the legs now to help unify the design. Here you can see I'm struggling to figure that out a little bit because the legs are actually kind of different shapes. I wasn't super careful with the symmetry there. Um, again, I was leaving it loose, but in this particular instance, it you know kind of bites me in the butt a little bit. So just trying to fake the symmetry of those white panels a little bit. And then of course, sometimes when I'm doing just brand new cuts like that, you know, I need to go back in and add actual cut lines to make it look like this was manufactured. So just going in and applying the same sort of colors and hue saturation layers to the lantern now. Now that I've got that mostly working, I can go in and add a bit more light, especially because this is sort of metallic, plastic y kind of stuff. Uh, we'll do a color dodge layer. So I apply that to the red first, since I know that that's going to be affected a little bit more, or rather I want that to be affected a little bit more. So I select the whole silhouette and then deselect my dark material and the lighter material. And that gives me just, you know, the red part and paint in on my dodge layer. And then once I've got that, I also want to apply it to the lights and dark sections. So I, you know, deselect and I'm, I'm applying it to the whole silhouette. But of course I don't want them to get too red in the white and dark areas which happens because my the color I'm using is pretty red. So what I do is I just leave it and then I select the uh, white and dark areas and just desaturate them to, uh, since those colors are less saturated anyways, I just deselect or sorry, desaturate the reds in those sections. Adding some more dodge here and there, especially to separate that forearm from the legs. Try to create that visual separation a little bit. So this part's interesting and I'll better explain it when I go through the layers at the end of the video here. But keep in mind that our grays were on a mask. And so any darks are basically, there's almost no pixels there because the mask is showing through to the black underneath. And meanwhile, all of our colors are being clipped to that gray layer, which means that things like color and color dodge and that kind of thing is all being applied to that gray layer, which in a lot of areas is being masked out, which means that our dark areas, we're essentially applying it to like no pixels or pixels that are only like 10% visible. So things like color dodge actually lose their effect pretty strongly because I'm effectively color dodging a pixel that is only 10% visible. So in order to fix that, I'm, you know, I'm finding that my color dodge is not working very well. So create a new layer that is not going to be clipped to that gray layer. And so I create a mask based off of the silhouette. So I'm not, I'm still painting within the robot, but it is no longer a clipping mask. And you can see that now my color dodge is working much more strongly because it is being used in a much more general way. So there I'm able to, you know, actually apply some color dodge much more strongly. Whereas before, because it was essentially being applied to very uh, transparent pixels, it wasn't working nearly as strongly as I had intended it to. Hopefully that makes sense. I think it will once I go back through uh, each individual layer to show you guys. Now we do another color dodge uh, just to hit some of those radii of the, uh, the panels because the edges of those panels would be you know, catching more light. So again, this layer is not clipped because I want that effect working very strongly. Still trying to figure out what exactly that uh, material is for the dark material. You know, is it um, is it a plastic or is it you know highly reflective? Is it is it quite a strong you know steel or something like that, which would have a stronger highlight and ultimately I don't think I liked it so I just end up killing the the larger highlight there and I'm just kind of sticking to the edges
Yeah, just going through hitting the different edges with with a little bit of highlight. And this is a subtle thing, but I think it really does help quite a lot. Also using it to call out some of those uh, smaller mechanical bits that are in shadow. You know, if just a little bit of those are catching light, it just hints that, you know, there's something going on in the shadows there. You obviously don't want to do it too strongly there because light would not actually get in those places. So it's sort of a cheat. Um, it is a little bit like you would get a little bit of, you know, rim light and that kind of thing from bounce light in there. So you would have quote unquote highlights in your shadows, but it'd be very subtle. So you want to keep those, you know, pretty dark. Sneaking in a little bit more bounce light there just to help some of the forms read a little bit more. Make them look a little bit more three dimensional. Your bounce light shouldn't be as strong as your primary light source uh, because they, by definition, are weaker because they're, you know, they lose power as they bounce around. Uh, but in some circumstances, I push that a little bit. Bounce light's always fun to play with, so. Um, it's fun to, to play around with it and see how far you can take it. Now I'm just adding some paint chips to make it look like the paint is uh, chipping away. So in order to do this, I'm actually just painting a flat gray color on the layer, but because it's being clipped to our light layer, that, that uh, gray layer with the mask, my lights and darks are already being applied to it. So I can paint you know, a solid color and my shadows and lights also get affected because it's all clipped to the same thing. It's the same thing that's happening with the um, all of the hue saturation layers. You know, the the red, the sort of dark blue kind of blackish color, and the white panels. The values are being applied because it's all clipped to that one layer. So I'm able to just paint in solid gray, and it still gives me the lights and shadows. Just trying to apply some chips to the paint where that would probably happen. Joints where multiple panels meet tend to get a little bit of wear and then any surfaces that would um, be prone to, you know, getting rocks chipped up or anything like that, you know, feet, hands, that kind of stuff would definitely get uh, a little bit more wear than other areas.
just darkening down the leaves a little bit to uh, push them further back. Here I'm just experimenting with different colors just to see if, I, I don't know if I'm fully sold on the red, you know, um, red is a pretty aggressive color um, and the stance doesn't tell me aggression. So technically there's, you know, a bit of a discrepancy there, but um, tried the orange a little bit and then tried to see if I could sort of blend the two. But ultimately I think I actually liked the red better. So I think I'd go back to the red, even though there is a bit of narrative uh, disjointedness there with the, the red aggressive color and the exhaustive pose. But maybe that in itself tells a little bit of a story. He's also got uh, a lot of rounded forms, which tend to be less aggressive. So there's, you know, a little bit of confusion there, but and you know, in this particular case, those sorts of decisions I'm not overly concerned with. So now it's time to figure out what's happening with this stick. You know, the weird lantern thing wasn't working for me. It didn't seem robotic enough. It seems sort of too pedestrian. So ultimately what I do is I've got these rooftop greebly bits as custom shapes that I got from, uh, I think photobash.org. And so it's basically antennas and stuff. So use one of those and just grab a piece of it so that he's holding, you know, some sort of mechanical antenna and add more wires and stuff like that. Basically anything that looks sort of robotic. And then I very quickly just sort of apply some light and shadow to that as well. And then just add a bit of a blue tint to it to make it match the, uh, the bluish, you know, dark material from the robot. And we're more or less done. Uh, all that remains is to add the number. I numbered all of the robots, 1 through 31, for the different days of March of Robots, since this was a monthly challenge. So just got to put the 31 somewhere, kind of skew it into place, try to figure out where it might sit and how it sits. And with this one, it kind of uh, gave me some problems. I wasn't sure where I wanted the number. Um, everything looked wrong to me. I can see now that, that my skewing was definitely sort of incorrect there as well, which did not help the situation. I forget where I end up putting it, to be honest. So skew it a bit and then warp it a little bit to uh, make it look like it is wrapping around that cylindrical form. There we go. And then I just mask in and out of it to make it look like that's chipping away too with time and use. Use of the robot, not use of the number. And we need some, you know, eyes and electronic kind of components. So uh, we do a layer with almost a white color to it and then it's got an outer glow in the, the blending options. So just adding different areas where, you know, we, we might get a little bit of uh, visual interest, a little bit of, you know, power lights or something like that going on. And there we go. So let's jump into the layers and I'll show you what's going on, particularly with all the, the masking sort of stuff. All right, so we've got our black silhouette and then you can probably barely see the difference, but there is a little bit of light on this layer here. Just a little bit lighter. Um, and again, that was just to, um, I found the contrast between this layer that I've got now and the black was just a little bit too strong. So you can see if I turn on that middle layer, uh, I don't know if the camera, will, or I don't even know if the screen will pick that up or not, but I can see it on my end. It just brightens it up a little bit. 
And so this is the interesting one, because if I hide the mask here, you can see that is the paint on that layer. It is just pure gray. Um, but I'm painting with the mask. So if we actually take a look at the mask itself, this is what it looks like. So you can see that I've got a lot of dark grays. And because this is a mask, those darker grays mean that, and the blacks mean we don't see the gray paint at all on this layer, right? It's showing through and that's going to not necessarily cause problems, but uh, like I said, certain things just won't get affected very strongly. Like color dodge when we get to it in a little bit um, won't affect it very strongly because the pixels are only like 10% there, right? Like if I hide this back layer, you can see that they're, they're basically transparent, right? Um, so applying things like color and especially color dodge to something that's mostly not there <laughs> doesn't help us a whole lot. So that's where I start playing with not having uh, clipped clipping masks. And I'll explain that in a little bit. So this is an example of another one that I did. And this is just to show you that there's no like right or wrong. You can do whatever you want. But in this one, I did sort of the same idea. I've got my black silhouette uh, for the front here. This one's a little weird because I separated the back legs. I pushed them further back on a different layer. But uh, basically the front of it, actually, let's just hide the back layer. So that's my silhouette there. And then for our light layer or our gray layer, um, you can see that this one, if we look at just the mask, you can see that it's solid white and solid black. The mask really isn't doing much. And in fact, it's, um, it's clipped to our silhouette layer. So the mask is basically doing nothing in this circumstance. Um, but the shades of gray are actual paint. So if I hide the mask, you can see that it doesn't do anything because the shades of gray are actual paint on the layer. So this is sort of the opposite of the other example where I'm painting into the actual mask. This is actual paint on the layer. There's no real difference. It's just a slight change of how things are done, but it basically gives you the same results. So with the gray one, now everything is being applied to that everything is being clipped and the way to do that is hold alt in between the layers and it will um, you're essentially using that this gray layer as the base for everything as the mask for everything so first i just do a levels adjustment because the gray is a little too dark so levels adjustment and you can see i'm mostly just bringing over making the lights lighter then we've got our gradient map. And again, it's being only applied to um, the gray layer, which is a lot of it's being hidden. So the colors will be affected less in the darks than in the lights. But here is where you can choose. This got hidden on my other screen, but this is what it looks like here. I've got my different colors, but as you can see, you know, if we wanted to change like the middle value, we could do something like that. That middle one's not doing it. A whole lot here. Let's try this. You can see how that affects it. But because my my values are pretty scrunched here, um, it's not doing a whole whole lot. But you can see as I move stuff around, then it starts uh, starts affecting it. So so again, the gradient map doesn't work quite as well because it's clipped and a lot of what it's being clipped to is is not really there because it's being hidden by this mask here. So if I unclip this and then make some changes, we can probably see those color changes more. See that? That did not happen before. And that's because the with the clipping mask, those dark areas, there's not many pixels there via the mask. And so it's almost completely unaffected. But for me, that's okay. I mostly just want a fairly solid color anyway. And then a hue saturation layer just to shift, but this allows me to change it to any color I want really. Um, so this is like more of a decision-making layer than a practical layer. And as you can see, I, I ended up shifting it four points, but like it basically doesn't do anything. Here is a color layer where I'm just applying uh, a subtle color differences here. If I do uh, 
if I unclip this layer, you can see I've got some more like pink hues over here and then some more kind of like orangey hues over here. So that's what's happening. Just applying a little bit of that subtle color variation. Then we have a hue saturation layer for the dark. So you can see um, my settings for that. And then if I look at this, that's, that's what that looks like. It's basically just solid white and black for which parts are black, which parts are white. I think I probably had a, like a line drawing here. There we go. Um, I also had that. So I did the lines first and then start applying the, the different hue sets. Another hue set for the lighter colors. Then we've got our gray for the chip paint and our color dodge. A bit of bounce light on that one. And then, so this color dodge is important. This, I'm gonna show you what's going on here. So if you can see my layer stack here, this one is no longer clipped. And that's, the reason I did that is because my color dodge here wasn't affecting it quite as strongly as I thought I was. Uh, in fact, I think I was painting in at one point with, with pure white and it still wasn't like that should have been blasting it to white immediately and it just wasn't being affected. And the reason for that is because again, when you're clipping to something that is basically not there, <laughs> again, look, looking at this one, those dark grays means that the pixels are basically not there. When you start color dodging that, there's not much to color dodge anymore, so it doesn't really get affected. So you can see here with this color dodge on, if I clip this, see how it kind of disappears there? Like especially this arm here, look, look at this arm hanging here. When it's clipped, that disappears. When it's unclipped, it appears again. And that's because when it's clipped, it's only affecting the pixels that it's clipped to. Whereas if it's not, then it's applying it to everything underneath it as a color. So that's one of those weird side effects from painting your values in as a mask because you're effectively hiding the pixels. That's something that you might have to deal with. It's not a deal breaker for me. It's just sort of an interesting quirk to it. Uh, some more dodge for the edges. And then here I've got a few different hue saturation layers where I'm just messing with the colors. Those all ended up not being used. Bit, more, bit of bounce light. That uh, the black layer for the cuts, cut lines. My stick as a separate layer. And then the number 31, simple enough. And you can see that I've got, it's very subtle, but this does have a mask to it where I just kind of erode it a little bit. And then my, uh, my glow. And what that's doing is see, it's mostly just a white layer, but it's got a glow effect on it as an outer glow. These are my settings for that. And that's basically it. Here's uh, my original sketch that I would refer to every once in a while. Uh, you can see how loose that that really is. So there you go, uh, the initial sketch to the finished render. All right, so hopefully that was helpful or at least interesting to some of you. So I have gotten some comments around the process and design thinking for mechanical objects and mechs. Also some comments about environment painting. So I am going to get to those things as soon as I can. I do have some plans for some upcoming series and things like that. So those might come first, but I haven't forgotten about you guys. I'm going to get to those as soon as I possibly can. In the meantime, thanks so much for watching. Be good to one another and I'll see you next time. Okay, bye. So what do we think?